Bill, what's your job these days? I work as a senior lecturer in Italian studies and I specialize on uh, early modern Italian European translators. Okay, early modern? Yes. Is I the use... same thing as Renaissance? Well, there's a different? very extensive debate about ah. terminology there. Okay. So yeah. uh, Renaissance is uh, can be seen as a, being an ambiguous term because it can relate to a very specific period in, uh, in Italian history, for instance, um, and that is not does not uh, coincide with the uh, uh, same term used in, let's say, in English studies. For instance. All right. So the period is totally different. So the periodization issue is yeah. something that okay. I like to avoid as much as possible. Well, in my but research. you've got centuries you look at. Yes. Which would be yes, that's right. So the period is uh, by early modern. I can include by using early modern. I can include anything from the 14th century to the end of the 17th century. Whereas sometimes okay. by using Renaissance, yeah. I would be limiting the period to the 16th century or late 15 and most of 16th century, which is not. Okay. Yeah, it's so really that's limited. pre print and post print. Preprint yes, print. It's you look at that yes, transition. So, and especially okay. in the very latest work I'm doing, I'm focusing much, much more on printed culture rather than sure. pre-printed. So. Tell us about the books you're publishing, because you're, you're bringing out all oh, these Oh, great. Oh, this is the publicity. Uh. Yeah, do, do, do <laughs> so, the publicity. So this is not a very good looking cover, but um, it's uh, it's a good book, nevertheless, an edited volume, Court, City Court Academy, which I edited with Eva del Soldato from the University of Pennsylvania. And it's about language use and interaction in early modern yeah. Italy. So this okay. is an Italian book about Italy. But so that's one, more general on the multilingual background. It's a multilingual yeah, background. Yeah. It's about uh, oral, uh, written uh, languages. It's about how the various languages, Latin, Greek, uh, Arabic, uh, Italian, the Italian vernacular has interacted okay. in various contexts. Okay. So oral, written, um, there's a sort of a very interesting chapter on sermons. Uh, okay. It's not a translation book, that one. It's also it's about a, translation, uh, but not just on that. Okay. So Good. I've uh, done a little sort of uh, chapter on uh, on gondoliers and how they use translation. Gondoliers like in Venice? Venice, Venetian gondolier. They translate. Rather, gondoliers working in Venice, but yeah. the chapter argues that gondoliers were not Venetian, just Venetian. They were, in fact, uh, multilingual speakers who could translate, interpret a uh, number of texts uh, to help uh, the Republic of Venice whenever they needed witnesses. So they could uh, uh, yeah. play that very important role of negotiating information. Uh, between and that's varieties of what's now Italian? or Between, between varieties, varieties of Italian, so Venetian, obviously, yeah. and other Italians, but yeah. also between, let's say, German, and yeah. uh, Venetian, or there were quite a few sub-Saharan gondoliers, oh, so right. they had, okay. of course, the whole clever so it was really good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this yeah. is a book um, which has also a beautiful preface by Anthony Pym, um, uh, which is on a book on trust and proof, and it's about translation, or rather translators in early modern or Renaissance, if you prefer, Europe. So yeah. it's a European, uh, has a European uh, focus. And, and the, then the proof there, is a reference to print. It's a reference to print, yes. So the book is about print, uh, print culture, um, and trust. Uh, it's a I think, very important uh, topic uh, mm. in the book, and it's really a, it was an opportunity to think more broadly about issues of trust and communication. In, in relation to translation, but in relation to translation, yeah. in relation to uh, the role played by translators mm. in modern cultures, how they built, created, so generated trust, while at the same time negotiated various practices of trust uh, in the production of culture, so in the production of printed text, but also in the uh, mediation um, of, of languages and cultures. So, but this, the thing uh, about trust is intriguing because because of my interest in, in risk management. Mm -hmm. Can that be extended beyond early modern? You Absolutely. think it's, it's a concept that works well there? Yes, yes. I mean, it started off by sort of trying to historicize trust, um, so looking at practices of trust in early modern uh, <laughs> Europe. But I would, I'm very keen, um, um, we've discussed this mm -hmm. in other um, sort of in, uh, earlier, earlier uh, discussions, um, I would be very keen to look further afield mm. and try to explore more recent yeah. practices mm. and try to get a more global understanding, especially in the relationships, I mean, I'm talking about 21st century as well, in the relationships between uh, East and West and 
so uh, the Middle East and, and, and Europe, and, uh, and we are trying to build uh, momentum there and try to see if we can... But this was an age together. when modern business practices were formed. Yeah, well... And, and the mathematics of, of, of risk were developing as well. Absolutely. I mean, trust was a key thing at that, absolutely. At that point in time. Yes, 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 yes. And, and also these sort of communities, like the uh, Sephardi communities, for instance, mm. and their uh, very strong network of, of uh, businesses and, and trade uh, very much relied on a very uh, specific business of trust. So we, we, we're learning a lot about, about these communities, yeah. really modern Europe. Yeah. And I think that we should definitely try to connect those businesses with what what's happening today. Yeah, it just occurs to me that a lot began there. Of yes. Work. I mean, it's not called early modern for nothing. No, that's right. But I think the interesting debate that's going on at the moment in social studies and uh, history and anthropology is precisely on how we can historicize those sort of practices, mm -hmm. uh, how can we connect what we do today with what, what started back then. And, um, and the debate is, I think this is the right time to, to look at these particular issues because uh, I think methodologies and theories are finally coming together, trying to sort of make sense of, of uh, trust, uh, issues of trust. Um, and so hopefully we'll... the, the other thing we find in your career, just before we get to the third yep. book, because it's <laughs> the third book, um, what we call these days collaborative translation, mm -hmm. uh, you're finding a lot of that. That's right. I mean, and that's well, actually it's a good uh, nothing new under the sun. That really. good intro to the sort of third book, book mm -hmm. because the third book, uh, uh, which is on vernacular translators in uh, oh, let, let's see them. So this is a Breckles, uh published by Breckles, and it came out last year. The it's others about, are published. You should mention the publishers. So Brill, this is Brill, uh, and this oh, is Rutledge, Rutledge yeah. and these are two edited volumes. This is a monograph. Um, so this book, uh, vernacular translator in Quattrocento Italy, looks at. Uh, practices of trust in a way. Um, so how early modern Italian translators uh, presented their work and themselves as uh, crucial agents of communication. And they therefore had to use practices of trust to convince the reader. Mm -hmm. This is pre-print culture, so scribal culture. How do they, how do they effectively convince uh, readers, patrons, that their work um, was reliable? And in preprint culture, this is what I try to discuss in my book, the notion of convincing the intended reader. Most of the time it was dedicated. These are, you know, I, I looked up so very expensive manuscripts. Um, Sometimes it would uh, require, to, to be able to produce this text, it would be a huge investment. A whole monastery would have to uh, try to find substantial amounts of money to be able to produce those beautifully illuminated manuscripts. And similarly, Kings, uh, queens would sort of spend a fortune to get these books produced. So, so why would someone want to invest all that money to have, let's say, a translation of a uh, classical text? The translator was uh, given the task to produce the text, but he or she would then be required to make absolutely sure that okay. the text had a value. The value. So it's a major business have have. proposition. It's a major yeah. business proposition, sure. and the, yeah. nothing could go wrong there. So it was very important to get it right. And the translator was given a task to make sure that, A, of course, the task would be carried out satisfactorily, but also that that, that notion of creating a text that would be that could be trusted was absolutely essential. So in a way, even more crucial than uh, than what happens in the, in the print culture. So does the collaborative aspect come in there? And collaboration the is essential because then the way built could be, uh, trust could be built was through notions of collaboration. Of, of actually generating a text that would be would just be a responsibility of one person, but would be a uh, an undertaking uh, that involved a number of experts. So, which is sort of it's what we see also. That we had, a, as you know, a conversation about this just a couple of days ago with uh, Professor Brian Richardson. Uh, and uh, in print culture, obviously, trust can be generated by using the prestige of an author or the prestige of a publisher. But uh, I think the situation is a bit more complicated in uh, uh, pre-print culture because, because ultimately the prestige is based on inevitably on collaboration of actually having a number of experts and patrons involved in generating a new text inevitably that could be, that could be uh, reliable and at the same time could be useful. Uh, Andrea, where were you 
your mid twenties. In my mid twenties, yeah. I was in mostly in Italy. I was in Milan, um, and I was debating what I was going to do next. I was uh, working. I was doing a BA, so I was studying an undergraduate student in Pavia, small town south of Milan, and I was uh, grappling with. Um, uh, Italian Renaissance studies and I was trying to decide whether I wanted to go to Australia after that or whether I was going to go to England which is oh, what I did Australia. in the end. Because you went to England? I went to England yeah, in the end. Right. Well I'm half yeah. Australian so right. my mother right. is Australian so I had an Australian passport from day one. Yeah. Um, but I was trying to sort of, I was unhappy with the fact that uh, Italian academia wasn't providing me with sort of exciting theories or with tools of the trade that would allow me to expand the sort of re research interest I was I was trying to uh, nurture um, so yeah so I was I was in Italy and I was also doing translation so that's where my interest in translation really began I was working as a highly underpaid freelance uh, translator working mostly for a big um, a publishing company called Rizzoli uh, translating articles mostly from English into Italian mm -hmm. and uh, mostly for a magazine called Sette that I think is still around mm -hmm. um, and it was fun it was interesting and I gave me a chance to learn a lot about the um, the, the registers how no translations need to be need to fit into uh, specific paradigms. So the notion of applying different strategies to translation depending mm. on the content, depending on the context, was something that really uh, interested me from the, uh, from the very early stages. And I translated um, articles about uh, mostly the US, Italy back then, maybe okay. still today, had a strong interest in what was going on mm. in American culture and, and politics. Um, so, so you went off to England to look. Then, after my BA, I went to the UK. Into it? yes, I was sort of keen to uh, to explore the uh, Anglo uh, academia, and mm -hmm. it was a good choice. But um, I found myself doing a PhD um, with a wonderful supervisor. But uh, it was very much philology. I continued my. Um, training in philology. So I found myself simply doing a very complex edition of a text, of a translation, of an okay. early modern Italian translation. So still my, my focus on translation discipline. continued. Yeah. Very good discipline. That was discipline. your PhD then? That was my PhD. So it was about understanding uh, the strategies, practices and self-fashioning, most important practices of an Italian, of a a northern Italian translator from the 15th century okay. and working out his library how because there were no dictionaries there were no tools of the trade back then so every translator had to rely on the library that was available at mm -hmm. the time and so I worked out what kind of text the translator had access to in order to improve the translation he was given um, it was fun, it was hard work. I spent a ridiculous amount of time in libraries, um, but I always enjoy working with manuscripts and, um, and early modern texts, so it was fun, but... What, where did you defend the thesis? I did it at the University of Kent, right, okay. uh, and I had uh, Diego Zancani from the University of Oxford also helping me out, so, but it was, yeah, it was based at the University of Kent. It was, it was a good experience, a really nice. So the, the trip to Australia Oh, we have to wait a little bit longer for that. Let's go through then, this quickly. Though. Because then I, I started working, I started uh, teaching uh, at the University of uh, Kent. Uh, very good experience. I learned a lot about teaching um, in an uh, English um, context. And then I, you know, love took me to Australia in a way. Oh, right. fell in there love. Has to be a reason to be And in that sort of then made me realise that uh, Australia was an interesting place to work. And so I was offered a fellowship at the University of Western Australia, I did a bit of work there, and then eventually I got a, a job, a lectureship at the University of South Australia. So that's where I sort of continued my teaching mm -hmm. research experience. And then, came and then finally, on. after 17 months or so in uh, in in Adelaide, I was uh, I was offered a position at the University of Melbourne, which is where I am now. So yeah. it's been what uh, 12, 13 years uh, in Melbourne. Okay. Hmm. Yes. Andrea, what kind of research have you been doing on translation? What would you like to see more of? I 
Uh, well, uh, what I would like to see more of is a sort of translation studies that um, integrates and expands its horizons. Um, so, uh, translation studies that um, has a sort of a stronger dialogue with historians, with um, cultural historians, social historians, and literary historians. And also, I like to see those sort of boundaries that are expanding. I mean, this is certainly happening mm. in the last few years, but I think that we need to see more of this sort of dialogue with different cultures and different languages. Um, so I'm excited to see that uh, in recent years there is more of uh, no, more translation studies can being carried out in, say, in Japanese studies, in, in uh, Arabic studies, and so on. But but I think that that integration, a sort of multidisciplinary approach, still mm -hmm. should grow. Should, uh, so particularly concerned translation history. Translation history we is, haven't is mentioned what the I'm book keen series. on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, translation history is my my discipline, if that makes any sense. And uh, there's a new book series um, that uh, we've managed to uh, uh, create um, just recently. Um, book series uh, that will be published by Palgrave Macmillan uh, that tries to do precisely what I just said. So it tries mm -hmm. to uh, provide a forum for scholars who wish to expand those boundaries I was talking about and and also perhaps uh, um, try to find a sort of different way, new methodologies to do to do translation studies historically. Um, so, so that's exciting and we're getting a few proposals. Um, coming in and so we try to sort of uh, get a book on the history of translation in India uh, to happen. That would be uh, the first or second volume to come out in the series and then with together with Anthony and a colleague here from uh, from German studies in uh, Melbourne, uh, Birgit Lang, we try to also write a book, a small book about what we would like to see um, in translation history and what translation history can, can do uh, in, uh, in the near future. Excellent. Andrea, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.